Question for you as we begin. What makes for a credible witness? You might say, well, they need to be familiar with the circumstances of the issue in question. They may need to be intimately at least involved in the situation at some level. Perhaps they, you would say they need firsthand information. But at minimum, we would probably conclude they need to be, to be a credible witness and need to have, well, they need to be an eyewitness or an ear witness to something that took place. The Apostle John was a credible witness to an incredible sight. Now, Scripture does tell us that there is nothing, if you will, outstanding regarding Jesus' physical appearance that would call him into question or call him out as special in a crowd. In fact, Isaiah 53, verse 2 uh, really makes that very clear. But considering who Jesus is, God in a human body, that's really incredible to me that men actually laid eyes on the God of heaven while he was in a human body for a short amount of time. Now, John's words carry credible weight. He saw, heard, looked at, and physically touched him who is in a category of one, Jesus Christ the Lord. And that one whom John wrote about in the Gospel of John, when the same John wrote, he took on flesh and dwelt among us. That same one that he wrote about can and will rescue you from a life spent of, uh, well, the scripture says we're by nature selfish. And we'll rescue anybody from a life of self-focus. Give purpose, give reason for getting up and moving into their world each and every day. The Apostle Paul would agree with that when he said the words in uh, 2 Corinthians 5. The love of Christ constrains us, compels him. Having concluded this, one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who loved them and gave himself for them. And John himself wrote this in 1 John that we're familiar with from last week. He said, What we have heard and seen with our eyes and looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. Then he concludes, says, these things we write so that our joy may be complete. The same John wrote the verse you're familiar with in John uh, 10, verse 10. The thief comes to rob, steal, and destroy. John wrote these words that Jesus said, and Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundant. And some translations will say, we'll have it to the full. Fullness of life, joy, is found when God, through Christ, is found and known, and as a result, fellowshiped with. This morning I'd like to pray, <coughs> excuse me, and then I'd like to read 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, and make some comments about those words. Let me start by prayer. As we begin, Father, thank you for, again, for your apostle, whom your spirit moved uh, to give us the words of life, to guide us, 
to challenge us, to exhort us, to rebuke us, to change us. <clears throat> Thank you for your spirit's work in his life and your spirit being alive and well in this room this morning. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. The Apostle John writes, This is the message we have heard from him and announce to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The basis for fellowship is proclaimed by the Apostle John in this text. Verse 5, God is light. Walking where God is, is walking in the light. So, sometimes that brings the question, where is it that God walks? Well, the word light can mean a lot of different things. But in this text, comparing it to light versus darkness, I suggest to you the light, among other things, represents holiness in our text. Rightness. Purity. That's where God walks. And then he says this, if we practice this truth, we walk in the light. But if we don't, but say we do, I guess the word for that is hypocrite. I guess. He says we're lying because the old phrase that we learned from, uh, from our youth up is actions speak louder than words. They always have, haven't they? Actions always speak louder than words. Saying we walk in light, but actually walking in darkness, the text says we lie when that's the case. Implication is, we know the difference. Keep in mind, though, always keep in mind, 1 John is written to the Christian, not to the unbeliever. So this is written to me, and you can say that about you if you're a born-again person. Walking in the light. Walking in the light is not only where the Father and the Son dwell, but folks, walking in the light cleanses us from walking in the darkness. Now, comparing light and darkness, light representing purity, holiness, sin in the text represents, or excuse me, darkness represents sin in the text. Saying I have no sin, the only person I'm deceiving is me, Amen. if I were to say that. And he says that, saying, I have no sin, it says, you, is deceiving ourselves. And we are untruthful when we say that. But then you get into verse 9. And verse 9 answers how to go from the dark to the light. In other words, how to go from sinfulness to holiness. For the believer is to confess the sin and the darkness that we walk in. Simply confess it. What happens when the Christian confesses to God his or her sin? Well, verse 9 says God is faithful to do two things. Verse 9 says if we, believers, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and he is right to forgive the sins that we confess and to cleanse us from all the unrighteousness that comes with sinning. Aren't you glad that you don't have to remember every sin to confess? Because I suspect, in fact, I highly suspect we all underestimate the debt sin places on us, even the smallest one. So how does one go from sin into fellowship with God? Well, he confesses the sin that prevents him from that fellowship. Folks, so this means believers are to confess their sins to God, even though the believer stands legally forgiven of sin. Isn't it interesting? The forgiven Christian is called to confess his sin so he can be forgiven. I would suggest to you what this is saying is, well, you don't have to raise your hand, but you answer within your own heart. If you're a Christian, you've been forgiven of every sin. Forensically, legally, you stand forgiven. Before that person who is legally in God's eyes forgiven of sin, when that person sins, it strains the relationship, the fellowship with the God who has saved them. And the issue is not getting resaved. The issue is not maintaining salvation. The issue is confessing to God what he's already said is true so that my fellowship with him is not hindered. What happens is, as a believer, if I sin, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not building a wall. I'm building a wall between me and him. And he says, if we confess our sins, he'll forgive them and cleanse us if we do that. So, does doing more good take that Christian back into fellowship with God? Folks, I suggest to you, no, it won't. It is the confession of sin that does that. I encounter many a person who... And let's be careful with this. We aren't to judge. We're to simply repeat what God has said. And many person tells me, well, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in good, or me, me and the man upstairs, we have an understanding. I say, well, tell me about that understanding, because I'd like to tell you about my understanding with him, too. That it's important to not only stop the sin, but God expects his children to say something to him when that's a pattern in our life. God exists in unapproachable light. Do you believe that? Let me just take you to a couple of verses. First one in 1 Timothy chapter 6 says, uh, He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light. Mm. Then there's a beautiful verse in Psalm 104. Just one verse that simply says this. He covers covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heaven like a tent curtain. And then the uh, major prophetic book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, verse 22 says, he, It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things, who knows what is in the darkness. And then, back in the Gospel of John, in the text we know well is John 3, 16, but the very next verse, after the verse we know well, John 3, 16, it says, uh, for the law was given through Moses, or excuse me, John 3, I'm sorry, it's John 1, John 3, 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, 
but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But then the Apostle John writes this. Jesus says, this is the judgment that light has come into the world. And men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought or done in God. Walking in the dark or uh, uh, remaining, running, if you will, from the light has consequences. Eternal judgment from God and an exposure of the deeds by the light. We are, we're so prone to self-delusion, aren't we? Now, for those of us who are faithful to be in our Father's Word every day, we aren't. But we sure are surrounded by a world that is, aren't we? Very much so. But there's a cure for that. Practicing the presence of God. Paul writes these words in 1 Timothy. Great is the mystery of of godliness. I have found that those that we trust, that we look up to, that seem to be the most godly, I have found that those that I look up to that are that way, they are the first to tell you just how much they still don't know about how mysterious and ultimately stunning God is. And they would say, great indeed is the mystery of godliness. One particular scholar sums up 1 John this way. He says, uh, fellowship with God is the essence of eternal life. One sentence that he believes that's the best way to sum up the book, and that could be, but folks, the most vital achievement in this life is fellowship with with the God in heaven while you're still in this life. That's the highest achievement any of us uh, would ascribe to. And I might even suggest, on a personal level, this might be the most important letter of all in the New Testament for the believer because it firmly emphasizes how to advance in the most privileged position any human being can enter into. It's walking with the God of heaven before you're in heaven, before the God of heaven. You can actually walk with him right now. John uses some pretty heavy statements in 1 John 1, 5 through 10. A little embarrassing, maybe even a little humiliating and devastating to, as a born-again person, to be potentially called a liar by God, self-deceived by God, and a hypocrite by God. And Paul would even say, even of himself, and whether Paul's referring to himself before salvation or after, the jury is out on it. But in Romans 7, he says, Know ye not that in you dwells no good thing? But later in that text, he says, but thanks be to God, gives the victory. And while those words are a little tough to hear sometimes in 1 John 5, how indescribably amazing that God still pursues man. For example, John chapter 4, let me just read one verse to you. An hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said in himself, God seeks your worship. He seeks it. 
He's seeking your worship. Romans 5, 8. Some, some of us know that one. For God has demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. Pursued. He's on a pursuit. As uh, one noted apologist used to say, the hound of heaven is chasing those whom he will redeem. And then 1 Timothy chapter 2, there was one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. God sent a mediator on behalf of himself for man who need redeemed. And then if you're still in 1 John, the first two verses of the very next chapter say this, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins. In other words, a satisfying atonement for our sins. Not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. God pursues us. Folks, God pursued you in spite of you. And I know that because God pursued me in spite of me. I'm pretty glad he did. He chased me. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. So 1 John tells you how to walk from darkness and into or back into the light. But let me ask you a question. How do you know you've done that? Is it just a matter of, ah, oh, I said a few words, therefore I'm, I'm back where I belong. How do you know you've walked, you've moved from walking in sin back to walking in holiness? I suggest it's similar to how you know whether or not you're a Christian. And it wouldn't be to look back to a walk down an aisle at some service along the way in your life, or maybe look back to a moment where somebody led me in saying a prayer. You know you're saved, like you know you're walking in the light. And I'm going to give you three things, three ways to know you can know. Nobody else can know three ways for you to know, three ways for me to know that I'm born again and that I'm walking in the light. The three words are love, humility, and obedience. First one is love. Love versus, now some say the opposite of love is hate. I suggest it's not. The opposite of love is indifference. Love. Love for God. Love for his word. Love for his church. Things that were not there before, that are there now. Secondly, humility. Opposite of that would be pride, wouldn't it? Humility, recognizing that I've got sin, or the things that I wrestle with, that I try to conquer, I'm willing to confess it and say it, seeking to overcome it. Personal struggles. Anybody here have any personal struggles? You don't have to raise your hand. I have a lot of confidence in you. We're in the same boat. Anybody who have any personal weaknesses? We need the humility to move from them, don't we? We do. And the third would be obedience versus rebellion. Do you find yourself living an obedient life, moving toward known truths, moving toward the things that will be uncomfortable to do, but are the right things to do, so you do it even when it's not comfortable. Toward obedience to clear biblical instruction. So at some point, the Christian, when he reads Scripture, he's going to read it desiring real conviction, personal a personal drive to grow and understand to make Scripture become real and personal to him. One way to do that is to read Scripture as if it was actually written to you personally. Let's try that as we close this morning. 
I'm going to reread 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. And I'm going to read it personally, but I'll read it out loud so you can eavesdrop on me. And I'm going to take the liberty to replace the we and us with I and me. To make it very personal for me. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is a message that we have heard from him and announced to you. This is John's words. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If I say I have fellowship with him, and yet I walk in the darkness, I lie. And I do not practice the truth. But if I walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, I have fellowship with others, with him. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses me from all sin. If I say, I have no sin, I am deceiving myself, and the truth is not in me, but if I confess my sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. If I say I have not sinned, I make him a liar, and his word is not in me. It's one thing to, to accuse me of lying when I say I am something I'm not, but even ramps it up, if you will, and says, I make God a liar when I deny what he's clearly said. Verse 9, but if we confess our sin, that word in the Greek is the word homologeo. Homologeo means this, to say the same thing. That's what that word means. To agree with God regarding what he says about my sin. Because my sin isn't just a oops or a shucks or golly darn heck gee willikers. That was a boo-boo. Folks, sin is a cosmological crisis that brought God right out of heaven to earth. And for me to say anything different about my sin really wouldn't be to be confessing it. I think it was Augustine several centuries ago who said this. He said, he who confesses and condemns his sins already acts with God. If thou also dost condemn them, thou art already linked to God. God cleanses us from all unrighteousness, as verse 9 says. The Greek word there is katharizo, where we get our English word catheter. And we know what a catheter does. It, it enters the body to remove things that need removed that could be detrimental, unhealthy, perhaps even poisonous. Folks, when we confess our sins to God, God catheters the soul, removes unrighteousness. If the Holy Spirit is dealing with you in this most crucial biblical truth, can I suggest we all bow our heads this morning and if there's something you need to confess to homologeo so that God can, can um, catharizo your soul, let's all take a moment. And if we need to confess something to him, let's just do that. You don't have to do it aloud, of course. But let's all take a minute, shall we? And I don't want to presume how long it would take anybody to deal with God in your own privacy. So by all means, I don't want to interrupt what you and God are doing right now. But what I would like to do 
I'd like to close our time in prayer this morning, and then we'll sing a hymn in closing. But have you ever, have you ever prayed Scripture? What I'd like to do is I'd like to close this, and I'd like to pray 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through 10. If, if you're like me, you've struggled along the way really knowing how to pray sometimes, right? Right? That, that's hard to know sometimes, how to pray. But I have found I am absolutely in the will of God when I pray, when I simply pray Scripture. But that's confusing to some. Let's uh, close in prayer, and I'm just going to pray these six verses. Father, thank you for uh, this time together uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you that the message John heard, he's communicated to us, that you indeed are light. And in you, Father, there is no darkness. And if I would be so foolish and to say that I have fellowship with you and I walk in sin, Father, you're right. I do lie. And that's not a truth I practice when I say I'm in fellowship with you. But I thank you that uh, if I do indeed walk in light where you actually are, that you and I can have fellowship, Father. The blood of your Son continues to cleanse me from all sin. And Father, I would be foolish to say that I have no sin. Because the first person it deceives is me. And therefore, the truth that I might espouse, Father, that I have fellowship with you, uh, that truth isn't in me, Father. But I thank you that when I say the same thing about my sin that you have already said, you are faithful to do the things I cannot do, to be forgiven and to be cleansed. And I thank you that you do that for all those who are yours. And so if we say that we have not sinned, we would make you a liar. And Father, we do not want that to come from our mouth or to be even be in our minds, Lord. So thank you for the convicting work of your spirit. And as your spirit moved John to refer to your children as little children, thank you that you've written these things to me so that I might not sin. And if I was to do that, there is an advocate uh, with you named Jesus Christ who satisfied you regarding my sin. So this morning, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be under your spirit and in your word through this feeble servant in Jesus' name. Amen.